Tune in to The Onyx Report, a bi-weekly analysis of how black males of all stripes experience American society and navigate misandry. Join me, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Fresno State and founder of the concept of black masculinism to examine the issues that impact the lives of black males. From history to politics, media to policy, spirituality to economics, join me to explore the hidden stories of black men and boys and will discern them from the stories imposed on them. Listen to the Onyx Report live on innerlightradio.com every first and third Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern. Check out episodes on demand at your convenience on my website at www.thassanjohnson.com. Also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash dr.hassanj, Twitter at twitter.com slash lordhassan, YouTube at Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, and finally, my Black Masculinist blog at www.newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com. critically analyzes the experiences, histories, and perceptions of black males in American society. I'm Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Fresno State, black male advocate, and black male studies scholar. In the program, we examine current events while engaging concepts ranging from institutionalized anti-black misandry to gynocentrism from a black masculinist perspective. Our goal is to remind people of black men's humanity. Call in after a half hour to the show at 310-928-7733. All right. All right. Welcome back to the Onyx Report, everybody. I hope all is well. It's been a little minute. As all of you know, the show broadcasts uh, first and third Wednesdays of each month. Uh, and then I post um, uh, an encore version of it on YouTube. Uh, so if you haven't found me on Facebook, um, the link, you can just go straight to YouTube and put in uh, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. Uh, you can also donate on Patreon uh, at patreon.com slash TH Johnson. Uh, also, if you do go into YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe um, to the channel. All right. Um, a lot going on. A lot going on. It's been a very eventful last couple of weeks, and um, I'm not going to catch everything. There's too much <laughs> in, in a one-hour segment to catch, but there are a few things that I wanted to shout out, right? And um, today's episode is, is kind of roughly entitled The Profitability of Hating Black Men, Harriet Tubman, Wonder Woman, Dolomite, William Styron, and the Academy. I have a thing for long titles, so forgive me. Anyway, um... Part of what I'm looking at today is obviously media. So it, it, it should be clear, uh, spoiler alerts, you know, don't go any further. If any of the things I mentioned are things that you're not uh, really ready to hear anything about, nevertheless, um, I think uh, there's some things that, that require some, some discussion, some reflection. Um, um, to start out with, I wanted to read an opening quote to kind of frame some of what I'm talking about. And shout out to my boy, Jason Musgrave, um, who sent me an article by one Maria Kaluglu uh, called uh, Considering the Male Disposability Hypothesis. This was written on June 3rd, 2019 on Quillette.com. And I read, in her analysis, Women and Genocide in Rwanda, the former Rwandan politician, Eloisa Nyumba stated that the genocide in Rwanda is far reaching is, is a far reaching tragedy that has taken a particularly hard toll on women. They now comprise 70% of the population since the genocide chiefly exterminated the male population. In a 1998 speech delivered before a domestic violence conference in El Salvador, former US Senator and Se Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said that women have always been the primary victims of war. Women lose their husbands, their fathers, their sons in combat. These statements are illustrative of a wider trend of male disposability. 
Now, male disposability is one of the 10 forms of anti-Black misandry that I describe uh, in my work. And it really has to do with just the, the obliviousness and the erasure of men, and most particularly Black men, as far as anti-Black misandry is concerned, from the discourse, from reflection, from memory. And these are the kind of things that this show is designed to challenge. But in today's episode, excuse me one second. Excuse me. In today's episode, what I wanted to talk about were some of the films that practice various types of conceptual violence against black men. And disposability is one of the most pervasive um, forms of that kind of conceptual violence, especially in terms of its erasure. Right. And we see it in the news a lot. You know, I remember even when the, the 300 girls were taken in Nigeria, there was all kinds of talk about that. But the 59 boys that had died a, a couple weeks prior received no attention. So part of what I'm, I'm going to pull out in some of this media is is kind of, you know, that dynamic, that tradition of, you know, a hatred toward black men, even if that hatred takes the form of male disposability. Right. Um, one way that we do see this happen before I get to the media, and I still need to get to a couple of current events, but it's going to be shorter today because I want to spend more time talking about some of the films. But one of the forms that we see this male disposability happen in black America, especially in, in you know, online media and the news, it are discussions about dating. Right. Um, for the last five to 10 years, depending on what you're looking at, you've heard and seen article after article about how difficult it is for black women to find mates, to find dating, you know, adequate dating uh, uh, partners and so on and so forth. This is actually another form of disposability because really what's on the other end of that discussion is what is keeping black men uh, from being uh, comparable or providing an adequate, uh, uh, what's the term, uh, an adequate form of um, presence that mirrors the success and status that, that, you know, many black women have achieved. In other words, um, instead of talking about the structural barriers and the structural issues that impact black men, even successful black men, instead, we erase them all together and make the issue about how difficult it, it is for women to find dates. That, that is a form of disposability, right? And I also include, quote unquote, successful black men, although that's a, you know, somewhat relative kind of term. Because uh, I was talking to someone online a few weeks ago, and I think I mentioned this in the last show where she was talking about the homelessness of black men. And I pointed out that, you know, even with the doctorate and tenure and all of that here in Fresno, I've had to, you know, apply for housing, you know, different apartments that I was trying to get into or houses I was trying to get into at a time when I needed to rent something. And, you know, it, I applied over 50 times and got denied 49 times. And in all honesty, the only reason the guy who finally ended up renting to me um, let me rent is he had been a neighbor of mine for five years. We had never spoken. And, you know, one day I was talking to him. I let him know I needed a place. And the only reason he rented to me is because he said, well, I can't say that I've seen the police knock on your door. So I guess that makes you OK. And it would have been one thing if he was joking. It still would have been problematic, but he wasn't. And, and, you know, so in that regard, just a brief side example, when you talk about, quote unquote, success or whatnot, for black men, there are always question marks about what that success is and how it looks. Uh, so just to kind of put that out there. Um, so that kind of disposability we see there. And this is why I propose black masculinism. And shout out to my boy Floyd Jarvis, who, you know, suggested that I kind of cover again what I mean by black masculinism. And that is basically black masculinism centers black males across age, class and sexuality and seeks to frame the actual state of black of black male life in measurable terms. Advocating for black male studies, we endeavor to empirically contextualize the major pillars that indicate black males quality of life. Carceral treatment, criminal and civil sentencing, leading causes of death, health, employment, income, wealth status, education, violence, intimate partner violence slash homicide, rape, housing or homelessness, types of labor, political approaches, wealth, family court impact, parenting, forms of protest, marriage, and the history of institutionally based treatment. These are just the beginning points of the analysis. So I call for black masculinism to highlight black male lives beyond society's assumptions, often rooted in stereotype and based on shorthand information, slanderous media representation, and even 
personal grudges. Now keep that in mind, long as that may have seemed, because by the time we get to talking about Harriet, the film, we'll have to revisit some of those kinds of slanderous media representations in regard from, to black, black men that stand in the place of actual documented empirical or historical data, right? Um, now, real quick, in terms of current events, um, just a couple of things this, this week. I wanted to shout out uh, the passing of one Jimmy, Super Rhyme Spicer, um, hip hop um, foundational figure, an artist, died, lost the battle to cancer, he died uh, Friday afternoon, September 27th, so shout out to him. Um, also, a uh, quick blurb um, or mention of the death of comedian John Witherspoon, who died October 29th. Um, John Witherspoon, well-respected, long uh, career in comedy, but I'll be honest with you, the thing that stands out most for me with John Witherspoon was his role in Friday, where he plays Pops. And one of the things that, that stands out to me, and often many Black men, especially those of us who you know weren't necessarily always able to be around our fathers, we actually crafted fatherhood from media, right? And so you have these instances, and this is actually an assignment in my spring black male experience class. I actually have the students map out in media the imagery and the image of black men that they have in their heads based on media, right? But I talk about it in terms of how they've, they've come to develop a sense of, of meaningful black masculinity from these media productions. So John Witherspoon's character in Friday was one of those figures because I remember him talking to his son Craig, played by Ice Cube, uh, before Craig is about to pull a gun in defense of himself. And he kind of talks to him about, you know, how back in his day they used to use fists and whatnot. But beyond that, he was saying the focus was to live. The focus was to stay alive. And that moment really touched me. Now, I'd seen Witherspoon for years. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of Richard Pryor. I remember him on the Richard Pryor show. But having him there in that moment, he took on a different meaning for me. One that forced me to put him in the pantheon of black father figures from media. And, and, and everybody has a different collection of those, most particularly black men. But just to name a few, he put that scene put him in there for me with James Amos, John Amos's James Evans from Good Times, um, you know, James Avery's Uncle Phil, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, uh, Lawrence Fishburne's Furious Styles from Boys in the Hood, uh, Sherman Helmsley, George Jefferson uh, from the Jeffersons, and even Bill Cosby's Cliff Huxtable from The Cosby Show. These were representations of black men and black fathers that ended up becoming a part of my imagination, becoming a part of my self-definition in various ways. They, they even kind of showed you how to conduct yourself in given situations. And that particular one taught me what it meant to speak very lovingly, um, especially to a son, son I didn't even have yet, about staying alive and the value of life, especially for young black men. So shout outs to John Witherspoon. Um, check him out online if you're not familiar or if you need to re-familiarize yourself. Um, also check for an interview with Jason Mitchell in The Breakfast Club. Uh, there's some interesting conversation there about the weaponization of Me Too and the confusion and frustration of black men uh, in regard to gender conduct and self-accountability. Uh, so I would suggest checking that out. And also, uh, lastly, as far as current events, check out um, Eddie Murphy, Netflix's Dolomite Is My Name. Definitely uh, an interesting piece where he humanizes one Rudy Ray Moore um, and gives you the backstory on his life. Um, and it, it, it speaks to the difficulty that many black men find themselves having in society, trying to not only navigate, but find some degree and some measure of success, right? And he kind of shows you the, the, the barriers that um, Rudy Ray Moore faces in trying to access that success, even going so far as to create a character that's very reminiscent of, of you know, kind of grassroots male, black male folklore uh, that he actually goes out and, 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 and writes down from interviews with the homeless, homeless brothers in particular coming out of the South. Uh, and he kind of records those stories and crafts this character of Dolomite. 
and the kind of mainstream hatred or dismissal of, of, of Moore's work is very reminiscent of, again, of another type of hatred that black men face uh, when, especially when trying to create their own heroes. And I should mention as a last thing, check out Prince's autobiography, Prince, the Beautiful Ones, apparently just came out in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and there are some moments in there where he definitely explains some family dynamics that are very reminiscent of what we talk about on this show in terms of uh, black men and what they deal with even in family settings. Now, to get started, part of what I included was a list of films uh, that we that I think are somewhat connected, not directly so to Harriet, but in terms of theme, right? I mentioned in the title that I would deal with Wonder Woman. You know, the new, there was a new animated piece that came out called Wonder Woman Bloodlines. Um, and th there's some interesting narratives there that I kind of wanted to pull apart for a little bit. I'll, t I'll probably throw in a little Terminator Dark Fate, some Star Wars. If you don't know, I'm a sci-fi head. But beyond that... Um, you know, I analyze narrative and I analyze stories. So to me, on a particular level, um, I can't help but make certain kinds of connections. And one of the connections that I'm seeing is a connection to a 1967 piece that uh, Dr. William Darity on Twitter brought up uh, when talking about the Harriet film. He talked about this, the, the work called Confessions of Nat Turner by one William Styron. And Styron's work was a very fictitious approach to Nat Turner. Now, on one level, it's kind of inescapable because Nat Turner's life, there's not as much detail on it as there, there definitely should have been for somebody of, of his prominence. Yet what we know is mostly from a very one-sided, slanted interview by a lawyer in his cell before he was you know, assassinated. Um, and so you know, any filmmaker is going to have to fill in the gaps with something. But with Styron, he filled it with a lot of racist and stereotypical narratives that he ascribed to Turner uh, and for many for generations who don't know who you know Styron is or what his work was they would have to yet again uh, pull apart all of these fictitious narratives in relation to the reality of Nat Turner right and thankfully the film uh, made by one Nate Parker a few years ago which I still argue is brilliant um, sidesteps a lot of this false narrative that Styron produced and put out in the culture. But I mentioned Styron for the same reasons that I think Darity does, and that's that we're seeing a resurgence of that culture, but it, it, it's taken new form. It's actually being produced um, still by white corporations, but the face of it is no longer that of white men. The face of it, in many instances, is coming from black folks themselves, and in particular, uh, black women. You know, and I say that because I'm talking about Harriet as part of the tradition that is produced in the early 1980s and onward by the works of folks like Alice Walker, uh, Toni Morrison, Oprah Winfrey, and even Terry McMillan. Uh, they created this kind of black feminist media presence or media, you know, posture, for lack of a better way to put it, that is trans contextual, meaning it can apply to, to historical pieces. It can apply to animation. It can apply to comedies and, dra and, and dramas, uh, films, television shows. And it was. And by that respect, I, I associate Harriet, Harriet in the tradition of the color purple. Now, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I wanted to situate this in Styron's work because I think we're still dealing with the same type of stereotyping yet done in blackface. And one of the most consistent themes from Styron to black feminist narratives, uh, you know, in regard to entertainment and media is the demonization of black men. This seems to be one of the most consistent tropes and the profitability of the hatred of black men is what I'm talking about here because there's profit from it. Styron profit, profited and many others, right? And that's the paradigm that has become fashionable and become consistently normalized, especially since the 1980s. So we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, this, I, I do also think I need to mention that I think this is actually happening in the academy as well. Uh, most particularly in regard to gender theory, which is not limited to any one field. It's kind of been immersed in many fields because there's kind of been a culture of uh, political correctness in regard to gender theory. And in order to be considered uh, cutting edge or at least um, 
modern, at least up to date, at least in the know, you have to articulate a very particular type of gender theory that is overwhelmingly one that has embraced the very concept of to toxic black, black masculinity as a norm for the most part. And that's juxtaposed with a kind of pure femaleness, a pure kind of womanhood that is inherently victimized and yet at the same time void of any complicity, void of any need for responsibility, and also in many ways void of any uh, kind of empirical reference. Um, so in that sense, what I think we see with black men in media and in the academy is a, is a very particular framing that's rooted in ideas that go back to uh, the, uh, well, really before the 1800s, but definitely by the late 1800s in terms of the ethnologists' uh, analysis and focus on black men as these kind of childlike yet vicious uh, monsters that are sexually threatening as well as, you know, just violently threatening. Shout out to Dr. Tommy Curry's The Man Not. Look into that more deeply if you have questions about what I just said, because he kind of outlines what the specific narratives are. And one of the things that'll blow you away when you read it is how consistently you can see those narratives played out in contemporary media. Narratives of viciousness, narratives of selfishness, narratives of um, failure, right? And so those things are playing out in both mediums. And it makes, and it suggests in a, in a strange kind of way, how separate are these? If you're gonna talk about media as this creative space and academia as this intellectual, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of, what do they call it? Ivory tower. Um, there's a lot of fiction being produced in both contexts when it comes to black men. And so I, I again, wanna frame Styron in the context of media and in terms of the academy, because I think that's what's happening. And I can go back 20 plus years. Well, I've been teaching for 21, so I can go back 30 years uh, in higher ed and talk about at each stage of my education, the types of classes I sat in where the demonization of black men was not only considered a norm, it was considered essential to understanding proper gender relations, proper gender histories, proper gender analyses, right? And again, this is popularized in, in, in media. Now, the, for the next, you know, kind of three pieces I'm going to talk about are mainstream for the most part, but they play into the culture that I think welcomes a film like Harriet. Um, I mentioned Wonder Woman Bloodlines, a small media uh, a DVD that came out a couple weeks ago, reinvents Wonder Woman's backstory. And um, I should mention her name. Um, the sister that voices her um, is is pretty popular. Let me see if I can pull her up right here. Um, I should know her name off the bat. I apologize uh, for not, but she is actually played by Rosario Dar Dawson, right? Um, and so in the film, they kind of retrace her origins, you know, kind of separately from, you know, the live action film. But this is one of many films that, that we see today that are very consistent in terms of representing um, you know, femininity and womanhood is something inherently pure. And Wonder Woman is the, you know, the embodiment of that. Um, and so in that, there's a serious emphasis on strength, right? This idea of womanhood as women as being strong, which is something that you almost hear with religious zeal these days. Usually when a woman is described, especially in popular media, the first term they use to describe her, the first adjective is strong. But the definition of strength that we see most often used is one that's very masculine in its representation. And then from there, in these film pieces, the demonstration of that strength is to dominate men. So in other words, it's a, it's, it's a strength ascribed to women that's masculine and then demonstrated at the expense of men. Uh, you'll find this to be the case in Terminator Dark Fate. You'll find this to be the case in, in a, a lot of different films for that matter. And of course, Star Wars as well. The last, the, the latest trinity, trin, trinity, you see the uh, trilogy, you see the same kind of dynamic, right? Where it's men being dominated in mass to demonstrate um, her strength. But her strength is only defined in very particular terms, right? And so in this piece, one of the things you'll find in the live action film as well as in the animated piece with Wonder Woman is that she's pretty oblivious to um, female evil. She's pretty oblivious to female wrongdoing. 
Um, she pretty much, you know, conceptualizes it in terms of men that need to be dominated, beat up, killed, and or imprisoned. But when women are guilty, she kind of just lets them go. And she demonstrates this un unceasing amount of empathy for them. Again, in the live action piece that we saw that came out a few years ago, as well as the animated piece that just came out. Uh, so in both pieces, there's a female villain. As a matter of fact, they share the villain, uh, Dr. Poison. And if you remember the animated film, Dr. Poison has come up with all of these chemicals to hurt people and kill people. Toward the end of the movie, Wonder Woman just looks at her and she runs away. And that's it. Uh, so very, some, a very similar kind of dynamic happens in the animated piece, except she goes even further to go out of her way for this female villain to redeem her and, 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 and help her come back to the light, right? But again, when it comes to males, there's a problem. Now, in terms of black males, there's two ways I would kind of mention this in relation to this film. One, Michael Dorn plays the voice. Michael Dorn uh, plays the voice of Ferdinand, which is the Nemean bull, I think it is, uh, from the ancient Greek myths. Uh, so he literally plays an animal man, a bull, a you know, beast man, literally, which is something he's played before because we see that with uh, Star, Star Trek where he plays Worf. Uh, and, and in that respect, um, kind of redefining Klingons in the Star Trek universe in relation to black men, something you really didn't see in the, in the original Star Trek. But when by the time you get to Next Generation, you see this connection with black men and animalism coming out. But the same thing happens in this. So he plays this this living, you know, bull man uh, who is in the service of Wonder Woman. Right. And, and, and so what the film kind of does is it shows you not only black men in terms of, uh, you know, Michael Dorn playing this kind of bull man, uh, but the acceptable masculinity between him and Steve Trevor as one that is in service to that defers to womanhood and femininity. Right. So the acceptable man is one who serves. And, and short of that is invisible. Steve Trevor, of course, being a blonde haired, blue eyed white man. And then of course the, the black male presence in terms of Michael Dorn is some type of animal beast. And either way, they are both in service to white womanhood. Uh, the other aspect where we can somewhat talk about black men is in their absence. Etta Candy, one of the characters in Wonder Woman is actually this time played by a black woman, actress, Adrian C. Moore. And um, in that respect, she plays this kind of overweight lesbian character who happens to be a tech genius and she understands explosives better than trained soldiers and she can fly a jet without training and fly it perfectly on her first time doing so. This is this kind of, um, I guess they call it a Mary Suing, the Mary Sue, that thing that's happening where women are just inherently better than men at pretty much everything. I, I, I've, I've said this even in my uh, written work. Um, up until a few years ago, my my 14 year old son was telling me a couple of years ago that he had actually never seen a boy beat a girl at anything in popular media, video games, cartoons. He'd never seen a boy win at anything because in the current contemporary era, women are just inherently better at everything uh, from physicality to intelligence. They're inherently STEM geniuses, tech geniuses, you know, martial arts masters, all of this. And men are just kind of bumbling around following them for their affection and approval. Um, so that's the kind of thing we see happening in Wonder Woman. In Terminator Dark Fate, you do have one black by a soldier who is helping them out. These are, you know, this is a cast of mostly white women. Uh, well, there's two, there's a Latina, um, and then we have a, a Latino Terminator for the first time. And then of course we have, um, you know, two white women who represent uh, the, the, you know, kind of push for the future. So they come to save this little Latina woman uh, from the, the current Terminator and so on and so forth. But in this dynamic, they end up going to the military for help and they find a black male soldier who um, is quickly injured and dismissed within a matter of minutes. And, and that's what I was saying earlier about certain types of hatred toward black men, because one of the, the, the forms of hatred we see is failure. And that's what we see here. He steps up to help, but he immediately fails in his attempt to do so and is, is quickly dismissed. And, and so it, so there's two dynamics to the film that I, I talk about. There's the, the absence and or failure of black men embodied in one black male in the film. And then, of course, this kind of definition of strong womanhood on masculine terms. Uh, and that's the only way. And, and, I, and I keep pointing that out because there are many ways to define strength. And I think there are a lot of ways that haven't really been addressed to the extent that they could. Um, like, for example, when I think about my late wife, um, she 
you know, lived with sickle cell and had one of the worst uh, forms of it and would usually be in the hospital w at least once a year for a couple of weeks. And every time she went, the doctors would tell me the same thing. They didn't know if she was going to survive. And one of the things that would happen if you ever came to visit Desiree in the hospital, she would go out of her way from her hospital bed to make people feel comfortable. She would talk to them. She would really, you know, and she would be the one sick. You know, I remember when we lost our daughter in 2000, um, it hadn't been 24 hours and she was consoling people in the hospital room, you know, while she was the one who had gone through this, you know, horrible experience of losing, uh, you know, our daughter. And I think this, we, we were, this was 2000. So our daughter was about five months along and I'd, I'd really not seen that type of strength um, in, in some of these mainstream films, the, the re kind of religiosity, the kind of uh, almost fetishizing of a certain type of masculine strength in women seems to be all the ra rage. But again, more so than that, it's at the expense of men that I take issue with it, right? Uh, it, it always has to start with the domination of men. So in Terminator Dark Fate, the first time you see one of the major white, um, new characters, white woman character who plays this kind of enhanced person, first time you see her, she's beating up five or six cops, male cops, right? And this is the demonstration of her strength, much like in the live action Wonder Woman film where she walks into a bar and beats up a bunch of soldiers. So this dynamic of dominating men is part of the culture. Now, I know I, I kind of went around that way to get to Harriet, but I think it's important because this is the, the cultural milieu that we're in, right? This is what is expected. This is what a whole generation, at least, if not two, have been raised on in terms of what womanhood should be and what manhood should look like in relation to that definition of womanhood. This is the context we have for, for uh, Harriet. Now, I will say that I think uh, I'm going to see Harriet, if that's something you choose to do, I would um, find a creative way to see it. I think that's the only way I can legally put it. Um, um, I do support the protests of this film, mainly for a couple of major, major reasons. Uh, the largest one, and shout out to Tone Talks and Yvette Carnell for pointing out the relationship between the film and one of the current issues going on right now that everybody should be aware of in regard to uh, Byron Allen suing Comcast, <clears throat> the cable television provider for 20 billion under, under an 1866 law ensuring newly freed African-Americans the same right to enter into contracts as any white citizen. The case will be heard November 13th of this year. This is section 1981 of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 designed to safeguard equal opportunities for Americans to work, bank, shop, rent, or buy a home and become entrepreneurs without racial discrimination. Um, it protects a, a broad swath of people, including independent contractors in the gig economy and consumers racially profiled by retailers in scenarios not coveted by their major civil rights statutes. This is from an article in the Washington Post. And really what it does is, is this issue affects uh, especially African Americans in an unprecedented manner. And so apparently, Focus Features, which puts out Harriet, is owned by N NBC Universal, which is in turn owned by Comcast. So that being one of the major issues to really, um, you know, be cautious of supporting Comcast, but also Cynthia Erivo, Cynthia Erivo herself, the actress who plays Harriet, um, having a history herself as a Nigerian of having some very problematic statements made toward African-Americans. Now, I am one that knows, um, you know, I've seen the kind of tensions that have gone back between, you know, uh, blacks from the Caribbean, blacks from the continent, you know, and from the, in here in America, tensions that go back and forth, and you know, in my upbringing and schools and so on and so forth. But um, it's a very different thing if you're in a position to play um, a major historical figure in, uh, on a stage like, um, like what we see happening in mainstream film. And if you're going to have derogatory beliefs about the people who, whose hero you're portraying, uh, I think that should be an issue taken into account when such characters are played. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something I think needs to come into play. And I, I personally think the film should have uh, hired Sharon Warren. And to those of you who may not be familiar with Sharon Warren by name, you are familiar with her. If you've seen the film Ray with uh, Jamie Foxx, she played uh, Char uh, Ray Charles's mother. 
And I have not really seen her since that film, but her, her portrayal was so powerful that I thought her career should have really taken off. And hopefully it has, and I've just missed, you know, some of what she's been doing. But I, I, I think this would have been a great opportunity for someone like her. Uh, she would have brought something to the character that I think was needed because there was definitely um, uh, a presence to Harriet that we've seen in her autobiography. Check out her book, Harriet Tubman, The Moses of Her People. This is by Sarah Bradford in 1886, but it's still a much better kind of way of getting a sense of who Harriet was than some of the things coming out now. So the film itself um, <clears throat> has a number of problems. I mentioned the two right off the bat, but to reiterate the third, you know, it, it comes in the line of the color purple in my assessment. And it really, in this way, takes Harriet and uses her as a platform to kind of, you know, you know, invest in the same tropes of black womanhood, especially in relation to black malehood, black manhood, that we see in some of these other films. Again, the color purple and a number of others. And I keep going back to the color purple because that was the, the, the seminal film that really introduced this kind of narrative of black men being more of a problem to black women than white supremacy itself, than slavery itself, than racism itself. The problem ended up being represented as black men being the issue. And this and this happens, you know, with this film as well. Now there there are many notable actors in the piece. I have to I have to acknowledge that there's some actors whose whose work that I generally liked um, that are playing in this film. And I think in that regard, they managed to pull together a fairly powerful cast. Uh, Clark Peters plays Harriet uh, Tubman's father. Vanessa Bell Calloway, you know, these are people whose works that I've always appreciated. And so they've managed to pull together some very powerful people. However, um, at the same time, the portrayal of Harriet is one that um, kind of doesn't really situate the, 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 the type of um, presence that Harriet was known to have, uh, historically speaking. And they kind of sidestep some of the violence she actually experienced, most particularly in terms of having her, her skull cracked at, I think, 13 years old um, when a slave owner threw a heavy item actually at a black male and she stepped in, in front of that and it cracked her skull. Instead, the film kind of treated it like you know, a fictitious superheroic kind of thing where she had these visions of the future. And it was said that she had visions, but the, the brutality of how that came about really wasn't dealt with, I think, adequately in the film in that respect. Um, also, um, when we get to it, there, there's, there's a number of things that are highly problematic. And one of the most problematic aspects of the film is Omar J. Dorsey's portrayal of Bigger Long. Now, Bigger Long uh, in the film is a slave catcher. He's a black male slave catcher that uh, carries a gun, brandishes a gun, uh, you know, very openly, and puts himself to hire for white slave owners who want to reclaim their lost, quote unquote, property in terms of enslaved black folk, right? And so he puts himself out there and, and, and for hire, right? The problem with this is, you know, at the time frame we're talking about, this is pre-Civil War, of course, and we're talking in the South. And, th and this guy would have, he would have been um, property on somebody's plantation more than anything. And he more than likely would have been killed outright brandishing a gun in the first place, let alone when he states that his motivation for doing this work is so that he can pay for white whores. Um, black men were lynched for far less. Right. Regardless of your papers or your status. So this was this kind of fictitious approach to this character was highly problematic uh, and it wasn't historically accurate. There was no bigger long in Harriet Tubman's past. There was no slave male, the black male slave catcher that came after her. And of course, at one point he shoots at her. She shoots back um, and he's he's killed by the very white slave owner that's trying to claim Harriet and, and, and bring her back into service, if not kill her. Uh, so it's a really kind of muddled kind of history. And Bigger Long himself, having nothing but an appetite for white women, is very reminiscent of a long history of uh, Mandingo kind of stereotypes where black men are nothing more than, than walking weaponized phalluses that are a threat most especially to white women. He's very reminiscent of that dynamic, very much so. 
and playing a character that's willing to go this far to chase down, you know, black folk who are escaping slavery is already highly problematic. But even thematically, he relates to Native Sons, Bigger Thomas, in some respect, at least in terms of the name. Um, and so symbolically, if you invoke that, Bigger Thomas was a character in the 1939 text Native Son, who accidentally kills a wealthy blind woman, you know, by putting a pillow over her face and, and killing her. He, he was trying to silence her, but he killed her, you know. And, and so you, you can't help but ask, okay, what's the connection here, All right? What are we actually saying with this film in this bigger character that looks like he's being kind of transplanted from Native son, and son in some fashion into Harriet? You know, what kind of role is this? And what is this saying about how Harriet herself is being perceived um, in that regard? So something to kind of chew on. But alongside that, there were some just some strange moments. There was a moment at one point where Harriet is is talking to a bunch of abolitionists who are part of the Underground Railroad, and the portrayal of them in the film was that you know they were mostly wealthy white you know liberals as we use the term today, and as well as you know kind of wealthy, well-to-do boule blacks who were all involved in this. And really, Harriet is the only one that gets her hands dirty. And so at one point when she's talking to them about you know, not pulling back from helping people get off the plantations, not pulling back from the Underground Railroad, because they're worried that the Fugitive Slave Act is going to change everything, which it did, but they were willing to pull back and she steps in and challenges them and says, all of you are too comfortable. And what's interesting in that moment is when she says you're too comfortable, she waves directly at the character who's played, who's playing um, Frederick Douglass. And so it was an interesting kind of moment in that, you know, it's like, okay, what kind of statement is being made there? What, you know, it, it, is it such that I'm just, I'm seeing things or that it wasn't really a portrayal that was purposeful? I don't approach media that way. I tend to look at everything as purposeful, whether it be problematic or, or positive. So in that respect, looking at this kind of gesture toward Frederick Douglass, it kind of links Frederick to Bigger Long only in the sense that both are a problem for the one character in the film that seems to have the proper understanding of what she needs to do and why, right? It connects black men in this kind of dismiss dismissive framework where black men need to be kind of checked and need to be directed by women and most particularly in this film, Harriet. And that, so that was a kind of strange kind of moment in and of itself that I thought needed some reflection. And I think overall, what I would say about the film more than anything is I saw the critiques of it and the protest of it before I saw the film. And I was in agreement with it just based on the kind of characters that were developed out of fiction that did not need to be there, right? Out of complete fiction. I mean, this was like, this is like going back to watch Independence Day and seeing Vivica Fox play a stripper. It had no point to the, it didn't bring anything to the story. It had no purpose whatsoever. She could have been a secretary and it would have been fine, but they made her a stripper. It was that kind of dynamic when you sit and watch Harriet, like why exactly does this need to happen? It didn't need to, it wasn't historically accurate. And like Dr. Darity says, if you're gonna trade in historical narratives by creating a film that, that suggests itself to be some type of biography, there should be some relationship to the actual history. And if not, she shouldn't have been named Harry. But what I was about to say in terms of my opinion on the whole film is when I finally sat down to watch it, I noticed that I wasn't as frustrated as I was before I saw it. And I thought for a moment, does that mean that the film is not offensive? I said, hell no. What I really came to is it wasn't as offensive as I thought it was going to be because I had been desensitized to the type of anti-black misandry in these types of films since I was a child. I remember watching The Color Purple for the first time. I read my mother's book four or five times altogether and watched the film I don't know how many times. We were latchkey kids, so we, you know, we were at home and, and television was all we did for a number of years, right? So in watching these films and, and watching films like that, and most particularly The Color Purple, I became desensitized to the representation of black men as monsters and demons. You know, I, I really kind of began to accept it as normal. And in, you know, film after film, I find myself ready to do the same, right, quite readily. I wrote a review of 12 Years a Slave a, a few years ago, and it was well acted, you know, beautifully acted piece. 
Um, but some of the moments in those kind of films that were very misandrous in regard to men, we consume without a lot of question because we've grown accustomed to it. You know, um, it, well, so anyway, because um, I, I can go off on a whole nother hour on just that. But, but that's one of the things I noticed about the film was my conditioned accept, acceptance of uh, these kind of tropes as normal, right? And even though I read these books, the, bi the biographies that they're based on, I watch these films and I teach this material, I still have to catch myself because there's been so much that's been normalized in these kind of dynamics. And when you do get a film that challenges that type of normalization, it's a breath of fresh air, but you even have to ponder why. So I go to, to Nate Parker's Birth of a Nation where his primary enemy is not a black woman who works in the house and is going to tell master. That's what the equivalent of a bigger, a bigger long was in Harriet. It, it wasn't his primary, you know, opponent was the slave owner he had. And then the institution of slavery. And in that film, you actually had a boy, a black boy who became a traitor. But what was interesting about Nate Parker's approach to that is he gave the boy some redeeming quality, meaning he was a boy first and foremost. So the decision he made to turn over those who were who were rebelling was one that a boy makes. And you could tell he was he, he regretted that decision because he joined the civil, uh, he joined the Civil War and, of course, fought um, to end, end slavery. So there was this redemptive moment from Birth of a Nation where you actually got to see this boy, you know, feel the gravity of the mistake. They show him crying at the hanged body of Nat Turner. Right. So there's 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 redemption. And there were in and these were various fictitious fictitious elements in Birth of a Nation because we didn't um, we didn't have very much to go on. But at the end of the day, Nate Parker allows us the opportunity to, to do that. Now, we only have. OK, hold on. Get that off the screen. Sorry. Um, so in that, we don't see that opportunity extended here. Now, I did. There, there were some black men that were supportive and positive and so on and so forth. But again, in Harriet, even though you had those black men, their positivity was measured in their deference to women, to black women in particular. Right. That was the measure. White women, for the most part, were represented uh, in a way that I think white women have been able to skate over for quite a long time. It, it really, 12 Years of Slave is one of the first times in a long time that I started to see white women, in, you know, during the slavery era, represented as vicious and participatory in the institution of slavery, rather than, you know, kind of these prisoners in gilded cages, you know, because throughout graduate school, uh, I would read pieces and, and often my gender theory professors would talk about white women, you know, as, you know, just these kind of unwilling kind of victims and, and almost put them on par with enslaved black folk, right? But what we started to see recently is that, so in the film, Harriet, you actually do see a white woman you know, who's actually very vicious toward black women and uses her tears, because I always talk about white women's tears as a political gesture, right? She uses her tears to motivate a lynch mob um, who actually come to take money from her farm since, you know, it's, it's Harriet was her quote unquote slave. And so she must be responsible for what the, for the slaves they lost and how much money they lost. And through crying, she actually transforms this mob who come to get their, their, their payment from her into a lynch mob, you know, through use of tears. So there was that, but that's something that we're starting to see happening um, across films. And I think that aspect of, 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 of any independent black film uh, production needs to be maintained in terms of the accuracy of the institution of slavery. But nevertheless, um, those are some of the issues that I think is going on. And I think a lot of this is coming out of, of a kind of black feminist inst in intersectionalist kind of bullying that's taking place in a manner that uh, I think keeps people from scholars to actors uh, kind of fearful. And this is why I brought up the Jason Mitchell interview on The Breakfast Club where you actually get to see the type of bullying that happens behind the scenes, especially toward black men, right? This, the, it, Jason Mitchell, you know, is, is probably best known for his role in the, the NWA film uh, where he plays Easy e And you've seen him in a couple other things. He played in The Shy, he played in uh, King Kong Skull Island. His career was just kind of getting off the ground, but he had some tensions on the set of The Shy 
And the implication in media was that there was some type of sexual issue. He clarifies this on the birthday uh, on the Breakfast Club, and he talks about how it's not it wasn't anything sexual in that regard. But he does talk about the ways in which certain women kind of use the Me Too moment to kind of bully him in a particular kind of way. And he talks about how he's learned to deal with it through a counselor, black woman counselor who tells him to take, you know, to focus on self accountability, but there's very little accountability in the larger spectrum for how this political moment can be used in the hatred of, and bullying of black men. And, I, and, and that's a discussion many are afraid to have because we don't know what the repercussions are. And so I look, I've known professors who have seen me and, and in private conversation, we've been cool, shaking hands and talking and laughing, but will see me at a conference and literally turn the other way and run. So as to not be seen in my presence, right? And a lot of that has to do with a fear of what will happen. So I've seen it and I've seen other black professors, you know, where, who have grappled with that if they've been outspoken about these gender dynamics and how they play out. And this is not, to demonize black women. It is merely to talk about the ways in which a political movement like black feminism can actually be used in some problematic ways. And I think it's important that we actually have the, we develop the vocabulary to have this discussion because it's having an adverse impact on not only the perception of, of men, but also black boys. And so I think it's necessary because we, we there's a certain empathy that I think is lost when the dehumanization of black males is accepted as a norm and it isn't challenged. And so I think it's important that we actually begin to have these discussions more publicly because they are happening privately. They are definitely happening privately, but they need to happen publicly. And there's something that, that I'm motivated to address with this because I remember in a recent uh, piece by Antonio Moore on YouTube and Yvette Carnell, they, they did a review of Harriet. And at one point, Antonio Moore talks about whether or not there's a need for a movement of black men. And then he hesitates and says, but I don't want to go there because I don't want there to be any, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here. He doesn't want there to be any breaks, you know, in, in terms of we need to come together as a community. And he's right. And trust me, I spent a good couple of years grapp grappling with how to approach this issue of, of addressing black men on non-stereotypical terms in the academy, in my analyses, and in terms of media analysis, media critique. And I definitely thought of that. And of course, in terms of producing the very concept of black masculinism and pushing for a movement that's really already happening. But the reason I, so I get the reasoning because I think in that moment, he articulated what I, a number of black males have approached me about. What will this do? You know, how will women receive us? What will this, this do to the community to point this out? But my response to that would simply be, it needs to be done because what we're talking about is true and accurate. I'm not talking about uh, dissension in the black community for the sake of it. I'm talking about adequately and accurately addressing what black males are experiencing, what they're articulating uh, against a tradition of um, uh, obliviousness, uh, the conceptual violence um, against an entire tradition that has used black men as a doormat uh, for other groups, for other demographics, you know, to position themselves differently, especially in the eyes of white society. If you can participate in the black male demonization trope, in contrast, you're able to present yourself as pure as void of the kinds of issues generally associated with blackness and in many ways uh in some ways whiteness you know you're able to position yourself in closer proximity to it by using black men the same way white society does and i think this is happening i think this is ha happening in media i think this is happening in the academy i'm seeing people's careers advance doing so in each one of those mediums and more and so i think in that respect um this is a conversation that 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 people who have relationships with black males across age, class, sexuality, location, you name it, um, those who have human relationships with black males should be able to speak to the breadth of those relationships, right? Beyond just one or two encounters and actually be able to talk about the wide breadth of human expression with black men that go beyond comfortable tropes that advance one's career. 
right? And I think that's kind of one of the things happening. Because even in the analysis of Harriet, what I'm seeing from, from particular people on Twitter and whatnot is the suggestion that somehow black men being misrepresented need to go ahead and accept it, need to just be quiet about it, right? That it's okay. It's really not that bad. Well, I take issue with that. I take issue with that. Not only in the portrayal of good black men solely as good because of their deference to women, but also in that you have this figure who's willing to trade in on his own people for his own sexual gratification with white women. That type of portrayal is absolutely ridiculous. And and so overall, what I'm saying is that when I talk about earlier how I got used to that, that type of filmmaking, what has actually changed is not necessarily the films themselves, but the conceptual ground that we currently stand on in 2019. People are not willing to accept these types of representations any longer. And because of that, um, the film may really represent itself like a, as part of a long line of other films, but because that conceptual ground is changing and people are willing to challenge these kinds of representations, that is changing the dynamic for how we are dealing with films, we're consuming media, and which media we want to support. And I openly call for people to do that. And it doesn't need to be limited to Cassie, you know, uh, uh, Lemon's film, Harriet. You know, we definitely need to broaden. Well, I'm not even going to say broaden because there are plenty of us that have already been critiquing a wide variety of films. But I would urge you to join the critiques across the board that uh, of media that promotes the demonization of the black community, but especially the demonization of black men, because the demonization of black men has been accepted as a norm. For so long at this point that we don't see it black men themselves don't see it and i think it's a problem that needs to be openly addressed and challenged you know much like you know there was a movement that challenged Styron's uh, depiction of nat turner that needs to remain constant in how we address this this dynamic now whether we do it you know it, you know in the theater or in relation to the theater or not in relation to the theater at all and we're addressing the companies that produce these films that want to take our dollars and yet advocate for policies that work against the very community that we we hail from. So I think in that sense, that needs to continue, right? That needs to continue. Um, that said, um, I think in that regard, I would motivate people to go back and support um, Nate Parker's Birth of a Nation. Um, I would urge you, even even some of the more recent works, um, I think the film Brian Banks is part of that, of what I would, you know, kind of look at in terms of that independent film tradition that humanizes black men. I would support that. The, these are the types of works that I think merit um, a, a very necessary check against uh, a long history of dismissing black men as merely the backdrop for um, all kinds of narratives that don't work in the interests of the black community. So I hope that you'll join in that support if you haven't already, and that you'll challenge others, family members, friends, um, you'll challenge them to actually assess why these things are acceptable, why they've taken to these things, and why in many ways there's no discussion about it in many instances. Um, I hope that you'll do that, and I hope that you'll continue to add to this discussion. Reach out to me on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, you can go through my website, uh, www.thasanjohnson.com. That's H-A-S-A-N johnson.com. You can reach me there, um, but also uh, join in on the discussions on Facebook, on my page, join in on the discussions on YouTube in the comment sections, uh, participate, you know, come into the know because this vocabulary we're developing on, you know, on and for black men is very necessary today. So I want to thank you for joining the Onyx Report, and I look forward to having you back in a couple of weeks. I think I have a guest that you will get quite a quite a kick out of. Um, so I will be seeing you on what is it the third Wednesday of this month, which is the twentieth at five p.m. Pacific, seven p.m. Central, eight p.m. Eastern. Peace.